quiz. So I'll start recording and um, uh, we can go from there. And with regards to the final assignment, you get that mark. I, I will return that hopefully tomorrow morning. Um, but with regards to the overall mark and impact on your overall grade, you won't get that towards until the end of the class, like the end of the uh, summer school. Um, it's just like a final exam, basically. Okay, so welcome to lesson three, the endocrine system. And we are going to start to look at some aspects of communication between cells and between the nervous system and any and other types of tissues that we need to be in control of, specifically with regards to homeostasis and how the brain controls all that stuff. So when you think about homeostatic mechanisms of our body, they have to be controlled and regulated by two interacting systems. That first one that we're gonna look at today is the endocrine system, oopsies. And that endocrine system is going to use hormones to send signals to organs on how they need to function. It has a very delayed response, it takes time, it takes a long time relative to some other aspects of communication within the homeostatic mechanism, but this is the long, very sure way of controlling specific types of organ function. So hormones, which we discussed a little bit in unit two, uh, in terms of what they can be made out of, we're gonna further deep dive into that and hopefully we'll be able to make those connections moving forward. The second way is the nervous system. When we think of the nervous system, we think of brain, spinal cord, nerves, they all use electrochemical signals and it is significantly faster. We're gonna talk about how those electrochemical signals work in the last little bit of this unit where we look at the nervous system and we talk about how that ion channel aspect is re revisiting that ion channel aspect and how as a result of that concentration of ions, we can propagate an electrochemical signal and that electrochemical signal, just like with ATP synthesis, can be responsible for um, things as beautiful as Mozart and uh, paintings as beautiful as Monet and, and all of that stuff. That's, that's the nervous system. We'll, we'll touch on that later. So, but for now, we're going to look at the endocrine system and we're going to look at how hormones are chemical messengers that the cells produce in one part of the body and it's produced in that one part of the body in an attempt to regulate a process of a cell in another part of the body. It sounds like a big mouthful, but let's take a look at how that process works. So the endocrine glands and ductless organs that secrete those hormones directly into the blood or into interstitial fluid. So now we're looking at that interstitial fluid again, forming that functional role as it connects the cells. And then now in this instance, we're looking at those endocrine glands that are ductless, and this is kind of important component, that are ductless organs that will secrete their hormones directly into blood and interstitial fluid. When you looked at the kidney, it had a duct that it had to go through this big process to filter liquid into that duct for secretion later. Here in the endocrine system, with regards to endocrine glands, they secrete their, their products directly into the blood or that interstitial fluid. So the pancreas is a, a gland that secretes insulin, the hormone that is responsible for blood sugar management. It secretes it directly into the blood, directly into the blood, okay? So when you think about the endocrine system, and when you think about that excretory gland secretion, that their products are going to be secreting directly into another body cavity or outside of the body. When you think about those excretory glands, we're thinking about salivary glands. We're thinking about sweat glands. So it's important to distinguish the two components between endocrine glands and excretory glands. When we look at those excre excretory glands secreting their products directly into another cavity or outside of the body, it's important to differentiate between an endocrine gland, which is ductless, and it secretes their hormone directly into blood or interstitial fluid. Excretory have glands, uh, excretory glands have ducts, I'm sorry, that produce out that, in this case, we're talking salivary or we're talking about sweat. But again, I can't stress how important it is that we differentiate the difference between endocrine and excretory. So most body cells are consistently exposed to an incredibly wide variety of hormones. However, there are specific target cells that will only ever be influenced by a specific hormone since they have very specific receptor proteins that recognize and bind to that hormone. Recall back all the way, all the way back to when we looked at our first two units and we talked about how proteins are going to be jammed into that phospholipid bilayer and those proteins are gonna serve many, many different functions. Now we're talking about that function in terms of hormone reception. And that hormone reception 
will allow for that target cell that is responsible for responding to that hormone that's produced by that endocrine gland or that endocrine cell. It's going to directly get connected to that, uh, that specific receptor protein if it has that specific receptor protein for that hormone and it will then modify its behavior based on that hormone. So those hormones are steadily broken down by enzymes and they're consistently removed by the body. So just like that messenger RNA we looked at last unit where it's, it's got a time limit, it's time sensitive, it has to get that job done pretty quickly or it has to be absorbed into that cell or connected to that cell quickly. Uh, but then after that, it gets broken down, right? So these products are either going to be reused or they're going to be excreted as waste. And if you recall back to uh, the lesson we just finished, when we think about waste, we're thinking about the kidneys because again, it's looking at filtering out that waste after it's been utilized, these hormones, after it's been utilized, filtering that out from the blood as waste. So I, I talk about these specific receptor, receptor proteins and that specific hormone, the shape and structure are going to specifically match. Again, much like we learned in our enzyme component of unit two, those enzymes are really specific for that, um, for that, you know, that product that it's going to produce. It's going to take in that substrate. It's very specific for, and it's going to create a very specific product as a result of its shape. The same thing can be said for those receptor proteins and for their hormones. So you really start to see the wide range that uh, a function that proteins can serve because they can take on so many different shapes and they can take on so many different shapes because as we learned in last unit we look at that primary structure that's formed as a result of the polypeptide chain then the secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures that can be formed and depending on that polypeptide chain you can now start to see how we're connecting every single thing we've learned in this class today. So on that note, let's take a look at the types of hormones that we're going to be talking about because one of the first types of hormones that we look at are called protein hormones or peptide hormones. Okay, so these peptide hormones are composed of amino acid chains, approximately three to 200 amino acids in length. And just like we learned in our last uh, lesson, when we think about the concept of proteins being shaped and proteins being structured on their genetic codes that are allowed, uh, we think about that again, the, depending on how the amino acid length is, we can look at anywhere from three to 200 amino acids and it can change the shape and structure. Uh, but they are hydrophil uh, hydrophilic and as a result, they, can be, they are also water soluble. So they can be transported easily from the blood as well as that interstitial fluid in and out of cells. And that allows for the trigger of cellular responses by binding to those surface receptors of those cells. It does not pass through the cell membrane because recall it is hydrophilic and soluble in water. It will not want to move through that phospholipid bilayer, right? But it does bind to that surface receptor. And as a result of that, that surface receptor can then send that message into the cell to kind of get that process going. Uh, and the one that I talk about with regards to the protein hormone is oxytocin. Uh, it is for used to induce labor. Uh, so when oxytocin floods a, a pregnant woman's body or a pregnant animal's body, uh, it induces labor in many ways, shapes, and form, but mainly it helps to create that contraction in those muscle cells, specifically within the womb and in the vaginal canal. Uh, another one is insulin, where it looks at regulating sugar within the body. And then growth hormone is another one, and there's hundreds, thousands even of those protein hormones that we can look at. Um, so when we talk about the product being produced by breaking down the hormone, no, we're talking about that hormone being broken down. And as a result of it being consistently broken down, uh, those endocrine glands need to consistently produce that hormone. Okay, so that's the first type of hormone, protein hormones. We're now going to look at the second type of hormone, which is a steroid hormone. And that steroid hormone is derived from cholesterol. And if you recall from uh, our unit one, where we looked at the macromolecules in biology, Cholesterol is a four lipid ring and that is going to be hydrophobic and it is therefore insoluble in water. We'll talk about how it moves in a second, but it needs to combine with something that's hydrophilic, i.e. a carrier protein, in order to move from blood to interstitial fluid to cell. So when we think about the uh, hydrophobic nature of fats and we think about its need for a carrier protein to kind of shuttle it around the body, it's important to recognize how these two protein carriers and the steroid hormone work together. 
And the other important distinction is that protein carriers are different from protein hormones. These steroid hormones usually trigger a cellular response by actively entering the target cell and then binding to a specific receptor molecule in the cytosol or the nucleus. And as a result of that binding, uh, we have to really think about that hydrophobic nature and that it can, can cross that cellular membrane. Some examples of that are steroids like testosterone, progesterone, uh, some other, ex oh, not there yet. Some other examples in general refer to um, some medications that, again, right, like uh, if you have asthma uh, and you take any type of puffer or inhaler, that's a form of a steroid hormone that helps to go directly into the cell it's supposed to target and produce the desired effect. So when we look at the two pathways for protein and steroid hormones, it's really important to recognize the difference between the two. I cannot stress how important it is to recognize the difference between the two. So when we look at that peptoid, peptide hormone, right, it is hydrophilic. It loves water. It's happy as a clam to be dissolved within water. It can move from the interstitial fluid to blood, from blood to interstitial fluid. Happy days. In order to affect a change on the cell, however, it needs to bind to that specific receptor molecule. And that specific receptor protein, sorry, that specific receptor protein is activated as a result of that hydrophilic peptide hormone binding to it. And when it's activated as a result of it being connected to this hormone, it changes shape. It creates this reaction within the cell and it activates a pathway that will allow for that cell essentially to change as a result of the set of those reactions. So when you think about something, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll save the regulation of blood sugar for later, but we'll talk about how it connects directly to aerobic respiration in the regulation of blood sugar. Uh, because if you recall, a peptide hormone is insulin. And if insulin is controlling blood sugar, that means we can control aerobic respiration. So well, again, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But really, I it's very exciting to really think about the connections that we can look and make uh, as a result of everything we've learned in the past three units. Uh, so I look forward to making those connections as we move. So that's peptide hormone specific pathways. Again, the important thing here to realize is that it binds to that receptor protein. That receptor protein then gets excited and is activated and it catalyzes a reaction and it goes down, down, down a set of reactions within the cell until it reaches the final end of that pathway where the change in cell happens, whatever that change in the cell is. Unlike, unlike the steroid hormone, which is looking at directly entering, directly entering the cell, right? Recall that steroid hormone has that carrier protein. And in, in this case, that carrier protein is the green fellow there, but whatever, you can think of it as you wish. And then that carrier protein does not enter. It will be reused, it gets recycled, it gets sent back into the bloodstream and back to where it needs to go. That hormone directly enters the cell. Again, it is hydrophobic. It's happy as a clam to pass through that membrane where it will then bind to a steroid receptor or steroid hormone receptor. That hormone receptor will then go on to do some type of work. In this case, it goes through the nuclear pores into the nucleus, which allows for that passage into the nucleus due to the fact that its shape is very specific as a result of binding to that steroid hormone. And oh my gosh, lo and behold, that steroid hormone receptor with its steroid in it can now bind directly to a genetic component of the DNA that is in our cells. And as a result of it, it can either act as a controller, uh, an inhibitor, an activator of that gene. And as a result of that hormone, we can look at some of the genetic material in our cells being altered, which in turn impacts the way the cell functions. So two very different pathways for protein and steroid hormones. But again, ultimately the goal of these hormones is to affect change within that cell. The last thing I wanna talk about with regards to this is hormones as part of a feedback mechanism. It is a consistent theme that we have learned in this class with regards to positive and most cases and negative feedback. The secretion of most hormones is in fact regulated by those negative feedback mechanisms, right? The hormone that is released at the end of the pathway inhibits the pathway itself. So in this example, we look at that activation or the inhibition components, activation being in green, inhibition being in red. That hypothalamus releases, in this case, a thyroid releasing hormone or TRH. That TRH binds to the pituitary gland. 
and then it releases a thyroid stimulating hormone. And then that stimulation of the thyroid releases even more hormones. But these hormones here at the end of the cycle, they are also responsible for negatively inhibiting the pituitary gland. So these thyroid hormones inhibit TSH secretion by the pituitary gland, thus controlling, thus controlling its own production and creation through a negative feedback loop. As that thyroid, thyroid hormone increases in concentration within the body, it actively inhibits the pituitary gland from producing that TSH, which stimulates that thyroid to produce those hormones. Okay, folks, on the next page, there is a nice little chart that you can use section 10.2. Um, no, we will not be learning all of these glands. We are just using this diagram to establish where they are located in the body. So again, I'm not going to have you learn every single one of these endocrine glands, but it's very important that you recognize where they all are. And you can use section 10.2, page 473 to kind of help you fill in that chart uh, or for your own notes. All right, folks, so I'm going to end the recording here and answer any and all questions. Uh, but that's it for the day in terms of lessons.